Okay. So let's talk about biceps disease. As all of you are uh, well aware of the, the basic anatomy, uh, this is just the long head of the biceps tendon. It connects primarily in one major band at the, uh, at the top of the glenoid, just superior to the labrum, where it may not be connected by, by fibrous bands to, to the labrum. Uh, usually you can see a little, on MR, you can see a little separation between the superior labrum and the main attachment site called the anchor of the biceps, but sometimes they blend in imperceptibly. There are also a little rootlets that occur on both the posterior and anterior aspect of the biceps tendon, and these we typically cannot see by MR. If those are torn, you can have some instability of the, uh, or some... Uh, uh, increased motion of the lung head of the biceps tendon, but by MR criteria, we really see it connect by one large band. And then, and then goes through the joint oh, space uh, over the humeral head and then extends into the intertuberous groove where it's held, uh, helped stabilized by the transverse band here, which are super continuation of the superficial fibers of the subscapularis tendon uh, in this location. On MR, you can you can see this in many planes. Uh, one time people like to do oblique planes, but that turns out to be very difficult. And as we'll talk about later, uh, positioning the shoulder and getting it reproducible is next to impossible because it's very hard to get the same degree of internal and external rotation each time. In general, we like to image the patients in external rotation because that's more likely to put the lung head of the biceps tendon in the, in the coronal plane. But most patients who have significant shoulder pathology will find it's very painful to be in the external rotated position, which means many patients have to be uh, imaged in either neutral or in an internal rotation because you have to image them in a plane where they're comfortable or you'll get too much motion artifact. Here's the uh, superior uh, uh, part of the glenoid in this location. This is actually the superior labrum. This is actually the biceps anchor. And on this one slice, we really can't see a separation between the two on this T1 weighted image. If we go a little bit more anteriorly, we can actually start seeing a little separation plane. We're getting a partial voluming of part of the biceps tendon here. And here's the superior labrum uh, underneath it. If we go in the oblique sagittal plane, uh, the normal shape of the glenoid process, uh, fossa is oval, uh, yet there's a little hat on top here, and this is the origin of the bicep, the, this is the location of the biceps anchor. And here we can see it uh, coming off here. Uh, this is an important structure that we're going to talk a lot about later. This is the corcohumeral ligament, which is kind of intimately associated with the biceps anchor at its origin, and actually in its proximal course, and is important uh, for stabilizing the shoulder. Uh, this, the area in here is a triangle that's normally filled with fat. This is the coracoid process to your left, humeral head to your right, part of the subscapularis tendon inferiorly, supraspinatus muscle up here above. Obviously, this is the acromioclavicular joint in this location. Uh, this area in here is called the rotator cuff interval. Uh, that's where there's a big separation between the subscap uh, tendon and the anterior part of the supraspinatus tendon uh, because the coracoid process does not allow you to have a continuous sheet of the rotator cuff. It has to be interrupted uh, because the coracoid process sticks out anteriorly off the glenoid. If we go more uh, peripherally, we can see this is the typical position of the long head of the biceps tendon, intraarticularly, coracohumeral ligament above it, supraspinatus muscle, supraspinatus tendon, muscular tendinous junction, and the location of the biceps tendon, which is anterior and inferior to the supraspinatus. As we go more, for, uh, more laterally, the biceps tendon starts to migrate a little bit away from the supraspinatus muscle, uh, and then it, it will end up uh, going into the intertuberous groove, or what some people call the biceps groove, but the technical term is the intertuberous groove. It's the groove between the lesser and greater tuberosity, uh, where it then goes to the muscle and distally in the arm. 
Bicipital groove, yes. Uh, so here would be the lesser tuberosity, there's the greater tuberosity, and then this, this is the intertuberous groove or bicipital groove, as uh, some people say. Uh, this is the long head of the biceps tendon, which should be almost round, slightly oblong, almost round, and should be seated deep within the well of the intertuberous groove. It should not be subluxed anteriorly. And though we don't see it very well here, this is the subscapularis, and then there's a little thin uh, ligament across the top here called the transverse ligament, uh, which are continuations of the superficial fibers of the subscap and help stabilize the biceps in the groove. So there are occasional uh, variations in the anatomy. Uh, here we can see what looks like a very funny groove, and we really don't see a biceps tendon there. In that location, if we follow it up, again, we don't see any tendon. And when we get up to the subscap where there should be a nice intertuberous groove, we actually see there's no groove there. Uh, and if we go to the other planes, we see the same thing. And there's a very rare congenital absence of the long head of the biceps tendon, in which case the groove doesn't develop because it requires the biceps to be there to actually uh, get normal development of the bicipital groove. Okay, here's a 27-year-old female uh, professional volleyball player who has shoulder pain. Uh, Michael, what do you think of this case? Okay, so we at the bicipital. At the bicipital grooves, I see two distinct uh, rounded, low-intensity structures have the appearance of tendons. Um, it doesn't look too irregular that I that I would consider a split-type tear. So I'm thinking this is more of a congenital anomaly perhaps maybe like an anomalous insertion of the biceps. I've seen something like this before, and I would consider that and look at the textbooks for it. <laughs> yeah. Well, we don't know where it's inserting. It turns out it inserts in the normal position in, in this. Uh, anybody know what these little black lines here are? Okay. Well, this is a normal variant anatomy. These are called vincula, and wherever you have tendons going in a long sheath, they're frequently attached to the peripheral synovium by little fibrous bands here called vincula, and that's a normal finding. And if you see that, you actually know that you're doing good imaging and able to, to visualize the normal anatomy. The fact that there are two vincula associated with nice rounded structures, which are nice and black, shows that this is a congenital bifid long head of the biceps tendon. It's not a tear. If it were a tear, you'd have a vincula to one component, but not to both. And you'd also expect much more irregularity and signal changes, uh, as you said. So this is a congenital bifid uh, long head of the biceps tendon and a professional volleyball player. And this was not the source of the patient's symptoms. Are vincula, all, are vincula always there? We're just not always imaging them? Um, you might have synovial extensions and so on, but it's a very fine structure. You can't even uh, see them very well. When you do surgery, though, you just peel them right off and, uh, and, and ignore them for the most part. I, I don't think they're substantial structures of any kind. Sure, they are surgically uh, important. But they are almost always there. You always find them there, almost. I think back of it, uh, on it, you know, I, I remember going through some of these things, but I, I never paid attention to it. I don't know. It's not common that we see them, but if you look for them, you will see them a lot more commonly than if you don't look for them. And I don't know what percent actually have them and don't. A lot of people describe them as though they're there all the time, but I'm not sure that's the case. Okay, here's a 43-year-old male with shoulder pain. Sean, what do you think of this case? Um, <clears throat> so, uh, sequential images uh, through um, the shoulder. It's, it looks like an arthrogram study. And um, it looks like it's externally rotated because the bicipital uh, groove is um, far lateral. And I can follow the tendon um, to about the top right, and then I kind of lose it. Um, so, 
I'm not sure exactly where it's going. Unless it's, I would have thought that would be the medial. Um, um, Metal gland or humeral ligament? Humeral ligament. Yeah. Well, I could see where you could, you could certainly think that. If you think this is the long head of the biceps tendon, well, it's abnormal shape. It's in a funny configuration right. because usually, remember, it attaches over here to the superior part of the glenoid. So the forces are pulling it this way. So the fact that there's contrast going into it and it's really on the lateral part of the groove would be distinctly uncommon. Uh, here, this could be middle glenohumeral ligament, but uh, you know, if we follow it up, it's coming up and it's attaching yeah. to the superior glenoid. Right. But I agree with you, with these cuts, it would be hard to know that, though it would be very substantial. It would be more of a cord-like metal glenohumeral ligament. Mm -hmm. uh, we already talked about some of those anomalies. But, but this structure is kind of odd because if you notice, it comes up. It doesn't come across like a biceps would, and it looks like it attaches to the glenoid here. And this is actually a dislocated long head of the biceps tendon. We'll talk much more about that in a minute. And there is another structure here that's quite common called an accessory head of the biceps brachii, which looks like more distally if, if the long head of the biceps tendon were actually in the bicipital groove, distally it looks like you might have a bifid or a longitudinal split tear of the biceps tendon. But if you follow the lateral component, it actually comes up and attaches to the humerus and doesn't go over and attach to the glenoid. And this is a normal variant called an accessory head of the biceps brachii. It should always be substantially smaller than the long head of the biceps tendon itself. But just be aware of that. And it's said to be quite common in, in whites if, if you look for it. Uh, here's just a diagram showing how the accessory head comes up and attaches to the greater tuberosity. The long head of the biceps goes over and attaches to, to the glenoid. Now, is this, is this different from the first case that you showed that, um, that you, with the vinicula vincula inside? Yeah. The first case, they both went up and attached to the, to the biceps anchor in a single attachment. And they, this just shows some of the pathology uh, where you can follow this and follow that uh, accessory head up and it attaches to the bone. Uh, here we can see what a, what a longitudinal tear looks like. Notice how much more irregular the signal intensity is, how irregular the, the tendon is. This is probably a little bit of the vincula, which is not entirely normal here, uh, but this is a more of a longitudinal tear. And there we can actually see the split tear there. More proximally, we just saw a single bundle of the biceps. More distally, we saw a single bundle. Uh, the biceps disease generally starts and is most common where the biceps enters the superior part of the intertuberous groove. That's where it bends over the humeral head and that's where it gets the most wear and tear. That's an area that, that we tended to ignore often with MR because that's kind of not well seen on the coronal images, not well seen on the axial images. It's kind of in a, a blinded zone for MR. And the oblique sagittal images are the best images to view that. So you really need to look at the biceps on all three planes. And when you start getting disease here, you tend to get increased signal intensity and thickening of the tendon, typical tendinosis. In this particular case, it's gone on to a longitudinal tear. Here's a case where in the oblique coronal plane, we can see increased signal intensity within the tendon in that location. On the T1 weighted image, we have marked loss of signal intensity. And that's not just partial volume if you go through the different cuts. It's increased signal intensity and thickening, which is kind of early tendinosis. More distally, the biceps tendon is uh, close to normal in size with just a tiny bit of signal intensity within it there. And as we go up here, what we can see are some of the early characteristic changes of early instability of the biceps tendon. It's no longer deep in the well here. It's actually subluxed over the bone here. It's irregular on its medial margin, has increased signal intensity, and actually this is an area where the transverse ligament should come down here and smoothly be part of the superficial component of the subscapularis, and the subscapularis could come down and have a firm attachment to the bone in this location. Uh, so what we're seeing here is a partial tear of the subscapularis insertion in this location. And we're going to talk about how to grade these 
uh, in just a minute. So that's biceps tendinosus, and in this case, it's associated with early instability of the biceps. And there we can see much more increased signal intensity within the biceps in that location. And there should be a black biceps here, which we don't see. One of the things you have to be careful with on some pulse sequences, tendinosis can look just like the surrounding soft tissues, and it's easy if you're not careful to say, well, the tendon's completely ruptured here, but then you have to look down more distally and make sure it's not in the intertuberous groove. Uh, in this particular case, it's intact. It's just severely tendinotic. So this is just some anatomic diagrams showing uh, how the lung head of the biceps tendon comes in underneath the transverse ligament, uh, underneath the corcal humeral ligament. We'll talk more about that later and comes and attaches to the superior glenoid. This is just what the dissected cadaver looks like uh, in, that, in, in that same area. Greater tuberosity here. Uh, and the shorthead, just remember the shorthead of the biceps comes over and attaches to the inferior part of the coracoid process. Now, the, a, the principal, well, I wouldn't say, a very important St stabilizer of the long head of biceps tendon to keep it from popping out of the intertuberous groove. Probably the most important stabilizer is the bone itself, but what helps keep it in the groove is what's called the bicep sling mechanism. And there's several different levels to this. One uh, that stabilizes it is the corcal humeral ligament that we already saw. It comes from a sheath underneath the, the uh, supraspinatus muscle. Uh, and uh, uh, it really goes from the humeral head uh, and attaches to the coracoid process. And this is kind of the, the roof of the biceps tendon, especially in the joint space, to try to help, help stabilize it. There are two bands distally, a medial band and a lateral band. Uh, and some of the schemes for classification injuries, the, the surgical schemes, uh, have to do with whether the lateral band, the, the medial band, or both bands are torn. Okay. If we go a little deeper, another very important stabilizer of the lung head of the biceps tendon is a superior glenohumeral ligament, which attaches to the glenoid just a little bit anterior to the, uh, to the, to the anchor. It actually parallels the lung head of the biceps tendon, then actually swings underneath it to attach to the humerus. And this is actually the floor, and it acts like a sling. So if the biceps tries to anterior dislocate, this will be a cord that will hold it in place. And we'll see that in a minute on the, on the, MR, on the MR examination. So if we look at it from kind of the lateral side here, this would be the glenoid fossa superior labrum, biceps anchor in this location. Here's where the superior glenohumeral ligament comes from. It will come in, wrap underneath the, the, the biceps to keep it from subluxing anteriorly, and then attach to the humerus. This is just uh, other diagrams and another article here in AJR, which shows this same sort of anatomy, where the superior glenohumeral ligament starts out anteriorly, it then folds underneath the biceps and then attaches to the humeral head, and that's the sling that holds the biceps tendon up to keep it from subluxing anteriorly. Uh, and we'll see that. And this is just, yeah. What do we see with MR? A very good plane to see this anatomy is the oblique coronal plane. <coughs> this is an arthrogram, or at least has fluid in the joint, but I think this is an arthrogram. Here is the biceps tendon, where a couple of centimeters distal to the biceps anchor. This structure above it is the coracal humeral ligament uh, above to underneath the super the the supraspinatus, uh, and then uh, it's part of the capsule, so it keeps the the fluid around the biceps in place. Uh, and then we've already talked about this anatomy. So let's, let, let me follow this out on an MR examination. So here's the superior part of the glenoid where the biceps anchor attaches. This is a little bit of the coracal humeral ligament in one location. If we go, go the next cut more laterally, what we're seeing is biceps tendon, coracal humeral ligament. This is the superior glenohumeral ligament coming underneath here. 
if we go uh, more distally, we can see the corcohumeral ligament here, biceps tendon, and now the, the superior glenohumeral ligament has already gone over and attached to the humerus. And now we're far enough out where the biceps tendon is beginning to enter the intertuberous groove, and then it's going to head down into the biceps muscle. Now, this is just a characteristic location. We can't always see this. Part of it, I think, is our, uh, the nature of our cuts. And part of it, I think, that this is an often damaged area. Here's the corcohumeral ligament. Here's that glenohumeral ligament coming around. There's the biceps tendon. And you can see why this is called the sling mechanism, because this is a sling that helps keep the biceps tendon from subluxing anteriorly, which is by far the most common way that it dislocates, but not the only way. Okay, and then here we can see, here's the biceps. You can see that anatomy. With a superior glenohumeral ligament in the middle and an inferior arm, it's basically thickening the capsule. And uh, you don't really see the capsule until you see the ligaments. So, uh, that's basically what it is. It's just a thickening of a capsule. Capsule capsule goes all around the joint. And in certain areas, it's thicker, and that's where the ligaments are. Now, what you can see here, and we'll put out in a minute, is that when you have a, a an unstable biceps tendon and it starts to sublux, you can have tears of any of these structures around it, which then are necessary to allow it to sublux. It can either be superiorly the cortical humeral ligament, or you can have a tear of the inferior glenohumeral ligament. Either one will result in a non-functional sling mechanism. So I like to divide biceps instability into seven grades. I don't think this is anywhere in the literature. Some of this is in the literature. There have been some recent grading systems which has taken the first four or five of these and put it in the system. But I think it's uh, much larger, including grade seven, which is John Yergudis's introductions to this. We've really been using this since the 1990s, and uh, there's some support from this from uh, Bennett, which was an article in Arthroscopy in 2003, which was an article about rotator cuff tears in this particular area and the hidden lesion. And there's also one by Habermeyer that I'll talk about in a minute. <clears throat> so one of the better known articles in the, in the orthopedic literature is this article by Habermeyer, where he says you can divide biceps instability into four types, and each one is associated with the type of rotator cuff tear in the region of the anterior interval. You can have a su all of these, notice, have superior glenohumeral ligament tears, either superior glenohumeral ligament or its association with the corcohumeral ligament. In other words, all of these require a tear of the sling mechanism that we've been talking about. And type 1 is where you have a perched biceps. Type 2, this is associated with a supraspinatus ten, uh, tear, uh, in, uh, which would be su superior. Type 3 would be associated with a subscapularis tendon tear or an inferior tear. And then type 4 is everything is torn. So this is a diagram from uh, modified from, from his article. This would be the normal, where you have the corcohumeral ligament, the superior glenohumeral ligament, the supraspinatus and subscapularis. Uh, type 1, we just have a tear of the uh, superior glenohumeral ligament. Type 2, tear of superior glenohumeral Oh, I'm sorry, this is the supra over here, and this is a subscap. This would be a tear of the supra and a, and a superior glenohumeral ligament, tear of the subscap, inferior glenohumeral ligament, and then the whole area around there is torn. So what do these look like? Sorry, this is a little bit of motion here, but uh, I kind of wanted to show this uh, specifically because you can evaluate this well even when you don't have the best images in the world. Uh, even though there's a lot of motion here, this, this tendon is still abnormal. It doesn't have the nice rounded or oval appearance that we like to see, and it's actually subluxed abnormally on to the lesser tuberosity. The center of the oval should really be in the center of the of the uh, intertuberous groove. Also notice that there, there is a partial tear of the subscapularis uh, tendon at its distal insertion in this location. 
Now, if we go to the oblique sagittal images, there's the corcohumeral ligament, which is nicely intact. But notice when we look at the superior glenohumeral ligament, it's injured. It's still, there's still part of it there, but it's injured. So a this would be a, a uh, this would really be a Habermeyer 1, or in our system, it's a type 1, where you have a perched biceps tendon uh, with an injured superior glenohumeral ligament. You don't usually have a pathology like this of the, of the biceps tendon uh, in its location uh, without some other pathology uh, like a torn rotator cuff or some other problem. So those isolated things like that do not occur uh, in this um, pathology we are talking about with the biceps tendon. Like this case, you look at the um, acromial process, what do you see there? And ch chances are the there's a rotator cuff tear with it too. It's a, it's a degenerative disease process. Sorry, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so here's a 60 year old radiologist who presented with a cuff tear, uh, but no anterior pain in 428 2003. Uh, so this is what the biceps tendon looked like. Again, it's a little bit perched here. The subscap tendon looks like it's fine. So uh, I wouldn't, you know, uh, in this particular case, I really re even wouldn't mention that this degree of perching in a report. I think it's, uh, especially since there's no symptoms there. Now he, he likes to play golf, and after a swing where he uh, uh, took more turf than he did ball, he developed anterior pain in the shoulder, and he came in with this particular image. And here we can see that there's a significant difference here, a couple of significant dif differences. One is the biceps tendon now has a very different shape than it had before. Notice how it's elongated, which is abnormal. And notice now how it's really perched over the lesser tuberosity, where it really wasn't going over the lesser tuberosity before. And also you notice that there's a partial tear of the subscapularis insertion in this location. Now, this is often called the hidden lesion because this, as you, if you stick your scope in here, if you're doing arthroscopy, you can't see that lesion. You can't really stick the scope down the biceps tendon, so you can't see that. So this lesion can be very difficult. And even if you open it from the outside, the superficial component of the biceps tendon, I mean, of the subscapularis tendon is still intact, and it covers over the area of the biceps. So this can be a very difficult lesion to detect uh, without imaging. And with MR, it's, it's very straightforward. So this is a very important piece of pathology that the MR radiologist has to know about because it, the radiologist may be the only one to make this diagnosis. And this is, is a very symptomatic lesion in its early phase. In the phase where you're still tearing tissue, this is a highly symptomatic lesion like we talked about before. Biceps and its location is very sensitive. It's got a lot of pain fibers in it. So it's a very, very sensitive area. And I, it, it's even sensitive in a normal situation. If you take your finger and press against the anterior shoulder area with your tip of your finger, you'll find that it's sensitive. And that's right where the biceps is. So it's very sensitive. I always hated orthopedic surgeons because they made you hurt even when you didn't. <laughs> you just hurt you. So, <laughs> so this is blown up so you can see it. And, you, and this is an important lesion that you always have to look for. And, and you, you can't miss this lesion on an MR study. So this is the so-called hidden lesion where you have a perched biceps and a partial tear of the subscapularis. And this would be a type type one on our classification system. It would be a Habermeyer type two because it's associated with a partial tear of the subscap. So even even with a
Dr. Cruz? I think we might have lost him. Oh, no. Okay. Um, maybe I okay. Somebody turn the mic off. Can you hear me oh. now? Yes. Now oh, yes. Can. Okay. Aha. Uh -huh. We have a mic with an on-off button on it. Okay. What happens to biceps tendon when you abduct the arm? Is it tighter or looser? Yeah, it's looser as, as you elevate the arm on uh, the, the biceps tendon. When you bring the arm down, that, that tendon is really on a lot of, uh, it's really quite tight. At surgery, you can't put your finger underneath it and bring it forward. Whereas when you abduct the arm, you can do it. So it's... Okay, so here's just another example. Obviously not normal. Perched biceps here, there's probably a little bit of remodeling of the inner tuberous groove as well, which can become eroded and, and chronic disease. Partial tear of the subscap, notice the transverse ligament is intact overlying it, which is important, which we'll see about in a minute. Abnormal shape of the biceps are perched. So again, this would be, in our system, a grade one lesion because it's perched, uh, and Habermeyer would be a two. Again. I want to point out again why in a report I don't put types or grades because there are all these different grading systems and a grade two in one system is not the same as a grade two in another system. So I, I, another, just trying to point out warnings here. I'm only putting in the grades in these type lesions to tell you what to look for. In your reports, you describe your findings. So here's a 56-year-old male with acute worsening of chronic anterior shoulder pain. Notice here what we have is marked remodeling of the inner tuberous groove. This is probably the original groove. Now we've got a, a biceps that sublux a little bit anteriorly, a little partial tear of the subscapularis there. And, uh, and then there's also, as John said earlier, these are usually associated with other pathology, and this patient had a... Had a uh, a tear yeah, that didn't freely communicate with the subdeltoid bursa. So that's a chronic grade one. Now the next one, and I, we first started seeing this back when we first did MR back in the mid-1980s. Uh, we saw these bizarre situations. Well, the first thing I saw were situations where the biceps tendon was actually located in the, in the joint space. The intertuberous groove was empty. I'll show that one in just a minute. And uh, yet the subscapularis tendon looked like it was intact. It wasn't retracted or anything. So, and the long head of the biceps tendon was still intact. It was attached to the muscle distally and it was attached to the superior glenoid at the anchor. So how do you get a longitudinal structure from outside of the subscap attachment to inside the joint space? Well, and then I can, I can remember as in 1988, at a case, this may even be it. In fact, this may be that case where we actually caught the biceps in the process of migrating between the two. So what happens here is that now we have the biceps that's no longer perched. It's actually dislocated. And for a short period of time, it will dislocate into the partial longitudinal tear of the subscap and be sitting within the subscapularis tendon. Now the forces are again, posteriorly, and medially, so very rapidly, this tendon, when you move it, will cut through the deep fibers of the subscap, and almost always when we see it, it'll end up in the joint space. And that's the most common location of a dislocated biceps, is dislocating into the joint space, but we're not there yet. So this, uh, when we catch the biceps in the subscapularis tendon, I like to call this a grade two. Uh, uh, and this we said, you know, this was back in the late, around 1990 when we started doing this. And then this, if you look at Habermeyer's classification, it would be a three. Uh, and uh, the next stage is it'll cut all the way through the biceps tendon and end up here in the, in the joint space. In this case, it's very tendonotic. And notice that we have an empty uh, intertuberous groove here because the, the tendon has subluxant biceps uh, and ended up completely dislocated into the joint space. Another example, notice if you look carefully, however, 
very often the subscap will certainly certainly be thinned or, or before because a lot of these fibers that are torn, the deep fibers don't really regenerate. So you almost always end up with a abnormally thinned and attenuated subscapularis tendon when, when you see these. So this would be what we call grade three uh, or an interarticular dislocation. About 10 to 15 percent of the time, however, when it dislocates, it doesn't end up in the joint space. It actually dislocates uh, superficial to the subscapularis, where it actually tears the distal fibers of the supraspinatus tendon, and that's the supraspinatus tendon tear. And then if it dislocates, it dislocates superficial to the subscapularis tendon. Again, this occurs about 15 percent of the time in, in our patients. Uh, and this I'd like to call an extra articular dislocation. Uh, this would be a Habermeyer II with, with a tear of the, uh, of the supraspinatus. Uh, and then here's just another example of the uh, extra articular dislocation of the biceps tendon. Notice the empty bicipital groove here. I think I messed up. This should be a Habermeyer 4, so I think this slide is in error. So that, I think, is a Habermeyer, uh, Habermeyer 4 is where both happen. We've already talked about this particular case, and we know that as soon as you have a vincula there, you know that that's uh, just a variant anatomy going here. The what, if you don't, what if you don't have a vincula? If you don't have a vincula, if the tendon is nice and smooth and they're both round like this, and if you follow it from the origin of the of the anchor all the way down as distally as you can, and they look nice and smooth and black, I would call it a bifid uh, uh, long head of the biceps. But, but the, remember, this is very rare. Tears of the biceps, longitudinal tears aren't real common, but they're not rare. They're certainly not as rare as a congenital bifid. So always be suspicious. Most of the time, if you see two structures like this, and you can follow them from the anchor all the way down, and it's not the variance we've already talked about, uh, it's going to be a longitudinal split tear. But uh, if they're very smooth like this and look nice and uh, black, then it may well be a congenital bifid like this is. If you see the vincula, then it's a slam dunk. And then, so here we have uh, what looks like two tendons there. We have a perching of one of the tendon with a little partial tear probably in the subscap. And we can follow that. And it actually was more superficial. Uh, and then now the, the next type is where you have a dislocation of the biceps tendon, but you have a complete rupture of the subscapularis. So there's a subscap tear, there's a dislocated biceps. This again, this would be a Habermeyer 4 because there's so much disruption of the tissues around it. And I like to call this a type 5 because the, the, the type that I'm using are things that are clearly and easily and, and can be uh, repeatedly diagnosed with MR imaging. To try to actually do a Habermeyer classification with MR, we don't really see the fibers like you do at surgery, so we're really kind of only guessing. So I like to use our MR classification, even though most of these can be mapped to a Habermeyer classification, uh, but we can directly see what we can talk about. And this, this, uh, this is a case, one of my favorite cases that Philip Terman sent. So it was an 81-year-old grandmother who was uh, playing baseball with her grandson and all of a sudden had a uh, uh, pain in the shoulder. And you can see she completely ruptured the subscapularis and dislocated her biceps into the joint space. Yeah, right. And this again would be uh, a type five with a complete rupture. Now, uh, <clears throat> this is a 28 year old male with shoulder pain after a motor motorcycle accident. This is actually the most, the rarest of all forms of biceps uh, instability. This, uh, there are only a few of these reported in the literature, but follow this one. Here we're distally within the, the humeral head. Uh, that looks like it might be a bicep, so let's follow it up and see where it goes. If we follow up here, we're getting closer to, 
uh, off the shoulder, but notice it's going posteriorly, not anteriorly. If we come up here, this is actually the, the intertuberous groove in this location, lesser tuberosity, greater tuberosity, but this biceps is way back over here. If we do the next cut, the intertuberous groove is completely empty. The biceps is way back here posteriorly. And if we go to the next cut, we can see the biceps is entering the anchor. It normally should enter from the front, but it's entering from the back. So this is a very rare posterior dislocation of the biceps. <clears throat> this patient obviously had a shoulder dislocation, but you can't see any of that. Uh, glenoid attachments. Do you, do you, for this, you need to have complete supraspinatus infraspinatus tears, or, or it could travel through the muscle like it does in the subscapularis? Uh, I think for this, you would have to have a complete rupture of the uh, supraspinatus and probably the, certainly the supraspinatus. And I guess it could go over the infraspinatus, but both the super and infraspinatus tendons were torn here. I have to saw through all that stuff, and, uh, and otherwise it would uh, take, come loose from the anchor. Uh, it has to go through all the structures on our back. Yeah. It has to the arm was probably uh, abducted and accidentally rotated. Yeah. You know, I, I guess, wait a second, I, I guess I'm a little long here. Thinking about this for a minute, would the cuff have to be, because the, the biceps is coming from distally, the rotator cuff muscles are coming and attaching to, You have to saw through everything to get back there. Yeah, I have to think about that a little bit more because I don't remember the cuff being that disrupted in this case. We we can go look this case up and look look at it. But anyway, that that is a posterior dislocation. Riga Riga here is the one who uh, first pointed that out to me, and then the last, which is a type seven. Uh, is a complete rupture of the biceps tendon with distal retraction of the long head of the biceps, which we can see here. And then sometimes these can be associated with large hematoma formation. Depending upon the age of the biceps rupture, you can get initially a an edema pattern from disuse and the uh, long head portion of the biceps muscle, and then eventually you can get fatty atrophy uh, over the long term. And the, a lot of these, are the ruptures actually occur in the groove, especially at the superior part where it enters, as we were talking about before. When they're ruptured, one thing you do have to do is you've got to look for the proximal stub because this sometimes can be long and sometimes this stub can sublux into the glenohumeral joint and be a... Uh, produce mass effect and act like a loose body in there, in which case uh, this needs to be resected. You can't really repair a long head rupture like this. Uh, you treat it either by just leaving it alone, and there may be a deformity which uh, incorrectly has been called the Popeye deformity. Of course, Popeye had big forearms, not big biceps, uh, but it's often called the Popeye deformity anyway. Uh, or you can t take the tendon and, and uh, 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 tenodes it into to the the humeral the humerus. John, do you want to talk about that? I've known patients that had complained about shoulder pain for years anteriorly. You examine them and you know that they had problems with the biceps tendon and and whatever else is wrong with the shoulder. And then uh, one day they'd come in the office and they say, "Well, the pain that I had over there is pretty much gone, but." What is this bulge doing over here in the arm? I said, well, that shoulder pain is going to go away. The bulge will stay. But there's nothing to do about it. So these are um, the acute tears like this where all of a sudden the tendon snaps. is many times what cures the pain that they've had for years in the shoulder. The pain goes away in a, a good four to six weeks, and but they do have a permanent 
There is a uh, famous football player who is a Hall of Fame quarterback who, for the last few years of his life, including one of his Super Bowls, he had a lot of anterior shoulder pain. It bothered him a lot. He saw basically every shoulder surgeon in the country. And then when he was practicing for his last Super Bowl, all of a sudden he felt a pop in his shoulder and all his pain went away. And he had one of the best games of his life in his last Super Bowl. And he came to his local doctor and said, uh, and when they explained to him what happened, and that is that his biceps tendon had ruptured and then his pain went away, he, he got really ticked off at them for not having cut it years before and living through that pain for so many years. So uh, well, how much um, loss of function do you have when you rupture a long head biceps then? Loss of function? Loss of function, yeah. Um, speaking of that, I'm, I, I would think that it would be a pretty substantial loss of function. 5%. You lose approximately 5% as well because you have the short hair of the biceps still attached to the coracoid process and you have the coracobrachialis. So, so the, the loss of the long head is not a big deal. Now, if you lose a distal attachment, that's a totally different ball of wax. We'll get to that with the elbow. And, uh, when people tenodice it, they, they, they basically pull it up and somewhere... There are several different places you can do it, typically in the distal part of the uh, inner tuber screw or in that area. You basically put a screw into the bone and attach it to that. Uh, I've been told that's for cosmesis, but then that actually is a surgical position. John, when do you think you should do a tenodesis of the lung head of the biceps? Uh, most of these uh, are uh, adults in later years, like 60, uh, 70, and so on. So. Uh, to do a major surgery to try and find that tendon, which is retract, retracted distally, uh, is not an easy task. And you have to sometimes make a nice big long in incision. Now, I've never tried to do it, so I, I, I assisted a fellow one time to do it, a football player, as a matter of fact, a football player for the Rams. And we turned out with a real ugly scar, but we did connect it. And we, but we didn't connect it to the same location. And some people feel that you can decrease the, the, the muscle bulk down below by uh, tenodicing it, but it doesn't really help for function. Uh, and this is just a 53-year-old female, decreased range of motion. We can see this big tendonotic stub of the biceps superiorly here in the joint space. It was causing mechanical problems within the joint space. Uh, this big thing here, and you can see that there's no no tendon in the bicipital groove. So, yeah, had, had the vincula left over here. Uh, let me see. This just shows a lot of scar tissue in the rotator cuff interval, which I think we're going to talk about later. Uh, but remember, there should be fat in here. One of the causes of pain in the biceps is actually having scar tissue here, uh, which can adhere to the biceps tendon. Uh, but we're going to talk about that at a different time. And this just shows some tenodeses where you can bring the biceps tendon back up again, put in a uh, anchor screw, and tenodese the tendon there. Uh, there's a lot of debate as to when this should or should not be done. And uh, most of the people I know who have had problems have elected not to have the tenodesis. But you can certainly see the cases of it. Is a 50-year-old with biceps tenodesis interference screw two weeks ago. Patient fell, and they were looking for a biceps injury, but we can see that, the, that this is the biceps tendon coming in to the uh, anchor. And you can see if you get the imaging in the correct plane, there's the tendon coming up. There's the anchor. It's nice intact, and they didn't, they didn't damage the biceps anchor. But if you think about it, you really wouldn't expect them to because this really isn't very functional in this location. It's not really a perch for the muscle function that's going to be in the in the uh, short head. So, uh, but we showed it was intact. What goes around that area uh, in terms of uh, structures, Sheila? In terms of stretchers, um... what do you not want to screw up? 
if you do the surgery. What, what anatomy of structure? Oh. Pardon? Oh, um, I mean, any kind of like the neurovascular bundle? Uh, yeah, it's an axillary nerve I'm talking about. Axillary nerve? Yes. Okay, well, you know, I think, let me see, I think, why Actually, don't we, well, let's sorry. stop at this point, and we'll start back up here tomorrow, because, uh, whoops, where are we going here, because uh, you're, you're, are you with us now, aren't you? Whoops, did we lose Yuri? Yes, sir. Oh, good, Yuri's here. Yuri has, uh, yes, sir. Yeah, uh, Yuri has created a presentation for us on calcification in the soft tissues. So why don't we stop at this point and uh, uh, let Yuri uh, give us his presentation. So Yuri, do you want to okay. take over? Sure. How do I, uh, can I, is there any way I, I could change uh, or do I ask you to? Uh, let me see. I've got to do something. Uh, just ask me to. Okay. Second. All right. I just need to do something here so that I make sure that it's displaying properly. Mirror displays. Where is it? There we go. What? What? Just a second. Okay, well, this isn't displaying properly. Just one second. <laughs> 